Book of Colossians, chapter number three. And here in Colossians, chapter number three, we're going to use verses 22 through 25 as our reading this morning. So Colossians three, verses 22 through 25. If you have it, say Amen. amen. <clears throat> Let's read, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with thy service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Amen. Now, as we're continuing here in the book of Colossians, we, when we started our study, we focused on some things related to the position that we have in Christ. When we talk about things of how the Lord Jesus Christ had accomplished so many things for us on the cross at Calvary, how he accomplished for us the, for, the forgiveness of sins, how he accomplished the issue of taking care of that sin death for us, and how the position of who we are in Christ this position should have the impact on the practice that we have. On, you know, another term that we think is the walk that we have. So who we are in Christ should impact the life that we live. And that's what you see that the Apostle Paul deals with it as he lays out the doctrine to you. You know, teaching someone this is what you need to understand and it always takes it from that aspect of this is what you need to understand to this is how it impacts your life. And last week we looked at you know, some of the things of how, or actually I shouldn't say last week, was last time we did Colossians. How the grace of God impacts the family life. We looked at the issue of husbands and wives and children and fathers and how the grace of God should impact all of those relationships. And it should, you know, and I always say that word should because it's not a mandate of, you know, it, you know, this is what's going to happen or else. Where the law had the thing of if you did not do the right thing, there was a specific punishment that was going to come, and oftentimes that punishment was death for failing to follow through with the law. The words that the Apostle Paul uses over and over again in his epistles is that idea of should, that the grace of God should cause you to do certain things. If you don't do it, you know, it's not going to impact the salvation that a person has. Because once they put their trust in you know, the fact that Jesus Christ died for their sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, once a person puts their trust in that, they are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise and given a guarantee of eternal life. So even if a person has no change in their life whatsoever, if they've put their trust in the gospel, they have salvation. And you know, the offer of salvation is open to everyone, you know, no matter what their circumstances are. In fact, we 
during the Sunday school, actually right before we got into our study of things of Job, we were kind of having some discussions about that, about how, you know, even someone like Adolf Hitler, who had done all sorts of horrible things, that the salvation was open to him because the Apostle Paul is the chief of sinners. And if God could offer salvation to the chief of sinners, there's nothing bad enough that anybody has done in their life to where God can say, I cannot forgive that. All sin was put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. So that way, everyone could have access to His righteousness. So, when we look at this and we start seeing <coughs> what the Apostle Paul is saying here, we see that he is taking it from, to a different realm here. And in verse 22, brings up this issue and says, Servants, obey in all things your masters. Now, these are terms that we typically don't use today. We don't use the term of, you know, servants and masters of things. But when the Apostle Paul was writing this, there were some things that were going on that you know, we don't have today. You know, we, one of the things that, you know, is that people could actually be put in a condition of what would be a servant, or another phrase for it would be a bond slave. So what happened, and you know, Jack always says, I you know, need to use him as the example, so I'll use Jack here. <laughs> if Jack got himself into a huge debt that he couldn't pay, what would happen is he could actually set, be put in a situation where he would become a bond slave where he would then have to work off that debt. So then he would essentially be a servant to whoever, whoever was holding that debt with that were continuously going on until the debt was finally paid off. Now, we don't have that today. You know, people go into debt, you know, and if you go get into such horrible debt, there's you know, something called, you know, well, you know what, I'm going to go into bankruptcy to protect myself. You know, we don't have the thing of all okay, camera, really, in a sense, sell myself into a form of slavery to try to pay off those dots, but you have individuals, and and we'll talk about him in a few minutes, Onesimus, in the book of Philemon, would have been in that condition, it would have been a, you know, a servant or, a, you know, the bond slave to Philemon because of debts that he had gathered up, and Paul is saying here that, you know, the servant is to obey in all things your master. So, you know, the obedience, you know, and he gives a qualification here that we're going to talk about when he says, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. But we want to first go over here. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 for a moment. And you see that Paul is going to talk about this relationship a little bit farther here in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. We're going to read here verse number 1. It says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So now Paul's giving this issue of that if a person was not counting their master worthy of honor, 
that the name of God and his doctrine would be blasphemed. Because God's intent is for a person who is a member of the body of Christ, you know, as he says in Colossians, is to obey in the flesh in all things. You know, not a thing of an, and uses that phrase of, you know, not an eye service, you know, not just make it look like a person's busy, but actually to obey. You because know, a person, you know, it's easy to kind of, you know, and I'm sure everyone has this, you know, person that they work with that, you know, it always seems like they're busy and always seems like they think, and you're not quite sure what exactly it is that they do. <laughs> but they always seem like there's all this stuff going on and it goes, oh, they work so hard and you kind of scratch your head and go, what are they really, <laughs> what are they really, but because they've set themselves up to look like they're working hard, look like they're, but they're not actually doing those things. And, you know, Paul's saying, you know, a person who's doing these things is, you know, he says they're blaspheming God and his doctrine. It's about they're going contrary to the doctrine that the God is giving us in the dispensation of grace. When we go over to Titus chapter number 2. Here, when we going to read verse 9. It says, Exhort servants who would be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. And so, again, we see this issue of Paul's instructions to the person who would be that servant, the person who's been, you know, who's supposed to be working. And the issue when you see with God is, he always talks about you know a person working hard. You know, when you look at the instructions we have as members of the body of Christ, is to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He equates, equates that idea of studying with the idea of work that a person needs to work at things. When you see the pictures of, I'm going to want to go over here to 2 Timothy chapter 2 for a second. Because you see that Paul gives the pictures of how a member of the body of Christ is to function and you see in verse, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2, the person is in, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You see in verse 5, If a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. So talk about you know, striving, it would be, you know, uh, since we would kind of call it the idea of an athlete doing things. In verse 6, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. <coughs> the idea of a farmer. Now, the one thing that those three jobs have in common, the idea of being a soldier, the idea of being an athlete, the idea of being a farmer, is that hard work goes along with all of those things. You know, it's, you know, when you think of a farmer, you know, it's not an easy job to say, uh, okay, you know what, the, the plants out there grow themselves. <sighs> and uh, you know, all I have to do is just kind of sit back and uh, maybe throw some water out there every once in a while and everything's going to work out. You know, a farmer you know, gets up. The moment the sun comes up, the, the farmer's up and is out there working all day working hard trying to get the ground to produce crops. You look at an athlete. 
the higher up an athlete goes, the harder they are working. You know, we look at it, for example, on you know, on a Sunday. And go well. You know, they're just out there for three hours playing a game of football. <laughs> you know, that's easy. Anybody could do that. There's a lot of hard work that actually goes into a soldier. There's hard work that goes in. God always intends for the issue of a person to put in the hard work. In fact, the issue he instructs the head of the household is about the idea that they're to provide for their house. His answer to you know, stealing. Let him that st stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. The idea of, you know, don't steal anymore, but work. You know, and you know, work hard at things. Not just, you know, put it as, well, you know, well, I can do it. I can do it the easy way and kind of, you know, you know put in half effort or put in the full effort. That's intended. <coughs> because you know, one of the realities of things is that for some people, there's people we only see at work. And everywhere we go, we are a, you know, we're supposed to be an example of what God is doing. And so if I'll pick on Jack. And if, if somebody sees Jack and you know every time he's supposed to be working, he's like this. You know, people start going, boy, Jack's lazy. Boy, Jack doesn't Jack doesn't want to do any sort of work. And they're looking at him in that way, and then all of a sudden he starts trying to share it with them. The gospel. Mm. Mm. Are they going to accept what's coming out of Jack's mouth if they're see, if they're thinking of him as you know this lazy, no good bum who doesn't want to do any work? Mm. And the answer is no. Mm. Now, if Jack is working hard, you know, he's never complaining about the hard work, and then he shares the gospel with someone. You know, someone's always going, boy, you know, Jack's always in a good mood. He works hard. He, he never he has a bad thing to say about anybody. You know, maybe I'll listen to what he's going to say. You know, I'll, you know, I'll at least give the listen to him. And Paul puts it in that, when we go back to the text in Colossians chapter 3, and we read verse 22, again it says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So the idea of, you know, we're obeying masters, According to the flesh. Now, there's a, you know, and that's really where there's a difference between obeying someone and the flesh and the idea of the things of the spirit, because we do walk in fleshly bodies. But the flesh, you know, even though we live in a fleshly body, can a member of the body of Christ walk after the flesh? The answer is no. We positionally positionally the flesh is dead. And because positionally it's dead, we can't walk in something that's dead. And the Apostle Paul, you know, one of the glorious things that he writes, I want to go over to Romans 8.
And you read here, when read verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I want to read also verse 4 before we start talking about this. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now verse 1 is talking about how there's no condemnation to individuals who are walking in the Spirit. So if there's no condemnation to someone who's walking in the Spirit, what would there be to someone who is walking in the flesh? Condemnation. condemnation. And that's why, you know, if there's condemnation to someone who's walking in the flesh, that's why God has to do something to keep us from walking in the flesh. Because a member of the body of Christ cannot receive condemnation. Because if we could receive condemnation, then we would lose the salvation that we have. And we're sealed with that spirit of promise. We're kept in that position of being saved no matter what we do. So because of that, He has to prevent us from being able to walk after the flesh. Now, you see in Galatians chapter number 5 that he's a, you know, walk after the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You know, we do live in a fleshly body. There are the fleshly lusts that we have. You know, if we're walking in the Spirit, we're not fulfilling those. But there are times when an individual, unfortunately, gives in to the lust of the flesh and does something that God would say is contrary to the doctrine that's been laid out. That's why you know, the studying of God's Word is so important because it's that each time we study, we take some of that doctrine in so that we have a greater understanding of who we are here and the better understanding we have of who we are in our position, the more in line that our walk is going to be according to what God intends for us. So when we understand our position, our practice becomes... You know, becomes you know, that ideal to what God would have. You know, and that's why it's, you know, we're obeying masters according to the flesh because you know, we're doing the things in our work. But you know, unfortunately, you know, sometimes there are things where you know, your boss might want you to do something that you know is contrary to the doctrine that you have. Now you have the decision to make. Do I obey the boss? What God, which God has said that I'm supposed to do. And if I obey the boss, then I'm, in this case, I'm going to do something contrary to sound doctrine, which is what God doesn't intend for me to do. Or do I stand with the sound doctrine not do what's been asked, but then not obey the boss in the flesh. <sighs> and those things can come up for an individual. Now, which direction do you go? And that's always, and that's why the text says, you know, back in Colossians 3, that, you know, and we're going to get to this verse in five minutes or so, that whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto man. 
our focus always is to obey God and the doctrine that's been laid out. So the things that we do always should be in a thing of pleasing to God. But before we get into that verse a little bit more, I want to just go over to the book of Philemon for a second because I said we were going to talk about Onesimus. And this is an example here of when we talk about the relationship that happens that what occurred was Onesimus was, you know, he wasn't a saved individual. He does the wrong thing. He takes off from Philemon and he encounters the Apostle Paul. Mm. And the Apostle Paul preaches salvation to him. Onesimus gets saved. And the Apostle Paul says, okay, Onesimus, now you got to go back to Philemon. Mm. You got to go back and do the right thing. You took off from him. In fact, when you read through the book, you see that he took some things from Philemon. Paul says, you know what? You know, let's read you know, verse 12 here of the book. It says, Whom I sent him again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. And the idea is, you know, he's coming back, Philemon. Receive him. Verse 16. Now, not now he has a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more is thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Because they're, they're, they're now two saved individuals. They're to have that relationship that individuals would have of you know, being members of the body of Christ. And that's you know, what can happen in the, the work situation is that we do here can have an influence on somebody else. Can lead them to that thing of wanting to know the salvation message and being open to receive it. And that's why Paul uses that you know, the verse that we look of, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto man. That the things that we're to do in our lives, everything we do should be unto God. It should be things being done to, in a way that would be pleasing to Him. I want to go to Ephesians chapter number 6. And you see here that Paul says here in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 6, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And and when you read verse 8, he's starting to talk about the idea of you know, building the gold, silver, and precious stones because a person is putting their practice in line with what God intends. And when, and when a person does this, it's going to produce the rewards in a person's life. But it puts the rewards in where our focus is. You know, individuals today want to put, well, if I do right, God's going to bless me here today. And if I do good enough, you know, 
now nobody can say this because the jackpot's not done. But if I do good enough, God will let me win that uh, 575 million dollar Powerball uh, <laughs> ticket. If I just do good enough. <laughs> We don't have that promise. We do not have a promise of receiving physical blessings for doing the right things. The promise that we have is we have received all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Our conversation, our lifestyle, is in heaven. Everything that is related to the body of Christ doesn't have a earthly focus, but it has a heavenly focus. So when Paul's recording here in Ephesians 6 and talking about that a person shall receive, you know, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth the same shall receive of the Lord, whether it be bond or free. <laughs> What a person's receiving of the Lord has to do with heavenly things. Something a person's not going to see today. We don't, you know, we'll see when we're with the Lord Jesus Christ after, when He comes back for the body of Christ. But we don't see it today. We don't have that thing. All we can do is we know what the doctrine is. We can do one. I want to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because this is why, this verse here is why the doctrine, when we talk about understanding the doctrine, the Apostle Paul lays something out here. And he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. The Apostle Paul was a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ was revealing the doctrine to him from heavenly places. So the Apostle Paul receives the doctrine and he records it for us in Romans through Philemon. And Paul says, you know, what we're supposed to do is we're to be followers of Paul just as Paul followed Christ. Paul followed Christ by following the doctrine that had been given to him. Paul gives us that doctrine so that way we can follow the doctrine that was given to the Apostle Paul so that we can do the same things of allowing the doctrine to come in to affect what we do. And when we do that, we are doing the things that God intends for us to do. Now, when we look at it from the practical side of things, so as we're here in 1 Corinthians, let's go back to chapter 6 for a moment. This idea of, you know, Whatsoever you do, you know, I love that. the Apostle Paul here in 1 Corinthians 6, we're going to start in verse 9. He's going to lay out some things here. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves and mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So he lays out all of these things of, you know, all of these bad things that, you know, people could be identified with. And so I said, you know, if you're, if you're identified with one of those things, you know, the person's not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And you read what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of our the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were those things, but now you're in Christ. You're no longer identified with those things. But he takes it a step further and says, verse 12, 
all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now I'm going to read here one more verse before we... I'm going to, this is actually going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, which is going to tie in with this. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, what the Apostle Paul is saying in these passages is, you know, as a member of the body of Christ, is there, you know, all things are lawful for a person to do. You know, there's nothing that's going to take away someone's salvation. But, all things are not expedient. You know, there's some things that a person can do it's not the best for them to do, you know, either for their health, for the impact that it could have on somebody else, the impact that it could have on the testimony that somebody could have as they're you know, trying to share the gospel with someone. It's that expedience. You know, it says in chapter 10 that all things edify not. You know, all things are not things that build up other individuals or build up yourself. You know, when you look at what God is doing during this dispensation, and especially when you take it into you know, the realm of you know, why do we come together? Why is it that we you know, take the time to come together on a Sunday morning and study God's Word. And the idea that the body of Christ is designed to edify each other, to build each other up. And that's you know, one of the main reasons why we do come together is for the edification, the building up of the body of Christ. But there are things that can that a person can do which is not going to edify. It's not going to build things up. It's going to tear everything down. I'll give an example. And I use this one because it's one of the easy ones that everyone could spot. You know, that, you know, if someone was coming in here drunk every Sunday, you know, and I use that because you know, you know, you know, everyone can smell the alcohol coming off of the person, and, you know, and see them stumbling in and slurring their words and going, you know, "What's wrong with that person?" Uh, yeah. Is that edifying to the body of Christ if that's happening week after week after week? No, no. it's not what got you. Know, God doesn't intend for somebody to you know, put themselves in that situation. You know, he says, you know, alcohol use in moderation is okay. Drunkenness is something we're not supposed to do. And someone's doing that week after week, and you know, the body of Christ is seeing that. You know, it's not edifying. You know, and that's where, you know, at some point, you know, the members of the body of Christ need to start coming up to a person and start talking about what's going on and start trying to help them get out of that situation where you're doing this because it's not it's not a good when you think about it from this way you know, if somebody came in here you know, and never been here before and they come in and they see that person that's in that condition and kind of see that everyone's just kind of Mm, kind of letting it go. Mm, mm. And it's that person who came in for the very first time, is that going to be edifying to them? Are they going to want to, are they going to, want to come back mm, and, be, and, and be around the members of the body of Christ? Chances are no. Because they're looking, well, 
I'm not sure what's wrong with them, but that's not edifying to me. And because it's not edifying to me, I don't want to be around them. The things that we do, and we'll go back to our text, you know, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Our focus in everything that we do should always be on you know, doing things that are going to please God. And that's, you know, when we talk about our practice, you know, it's Christ living through us. That's why the Apostle Paul can say things. I want to go to the book of Philippians for a moment. I want to go to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The, you know, we can do all things when it says we take ourselves out of the way and we do things in Christ. Because through Christ, we can do all things because He's strengthening us. He, he's you know, the one who's getting the glory when we're turning things over to Him. With and that's why you know, there's a difference between that idea of trying to please God by <coughs> allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to live through us and trying to do things to please men. Because men, if we try to please mankind, how is that we're always going to be contrary to the things of God? Because then natural man is contrary to God. You can look at Romans 1 about how man has gone, you know, without salvation, has taken the glory of God and just keeps reducing it down. Look at the world today. You know, it doesn't take long to realize you know, how far the world has gone away from the things of God. You know, to where you know, sometimes you question and think, of, are there actually people who believe in God anymore? <sighs> because you know, everything seems to be you know, taking the focus farther and farther away from God to where if you're Okay, if I go somewhere and I pull out a Bible and start reading it, you know, what's going to be the reaction? And if you ever want to see the you know, do that sometime. You know, go into you know, go into like a restaurant by yourself and sit at a table and start reading a Bible and see what happens. You know that, you know, especially if it's a place where you can seat yourself, you'll see very quickly that all of a sudden you'll have a ring of tables around you that are empty. <laughs> because, you know, I don't want to be around, you know, that guy's reading a Bible, I don't want to be, I don't want to be anywhere around that. That's all, you know, I should only hear things about this when I go to church. I shouldn't hear that anywhere else. What does God say? God says in everything, we're supposed to be doing things that would be pleasing to God. If we're doing things that are pleasing to God, one of the things is that it's God's will that all men would be saved. So if it's God's will that all men would be saved, then what would be pleasing to God is the fact that we're sharing the gospel with individuals. If you're sharing the gospel with individuals, you, know, you can only share the gospel through what's said in the Word of God, which means you have to talk about the Word of God. 
You can't you can't bring someone to salvation without what's without what's written in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just say a bunch of words to someone and go, "Okay, oh, you know what? I I believe that Christ died for my sins according to the Scriptures." What? And it can't even say according to the Scriptures because <laughs> because I've taken the Bible away from things. What's pleasing to God always comes back to the things of God's Word. The problem becomes in that individuals, rather than you know, taking the stand for sound doctrine, allow themselves, I want to go over to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Because Paul starts to warn Timothy about these things. I'll read here verse number 8 of 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. We'll read verse 9 as well. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus, before the world began. And what happens is that individuals start to become ashamed of 